Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, uh, I want to clear something up here this morning before I start. Last week, I made a comment about strongholds that God had showed me in my life. And I made a comment that one of those strongholds God was showing me is a lack of confidence. And I want to clear that up. It is not a lack of confidence in God or His Word at all. It's a lack of confidence in being able to carry out His Word. And we all have to gain that. We know God's Word. We know what He's promised. We need to get our confidence up in the fact that we can take the steps God showed us and they're going to work. So, wanted to clear that up. Some of you may be seated this morning. I've asked Lynn to read our scripture verses that we've been reading here. We're in Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's take our Bibles this morning. Here's what God wants to do. Would you like to know what God wants to do in this place today? Hmm? Anybody? Yes. All right. Here's what God wants to do in this place today. In Oasis of Life Ministries, in this sanctuary, in this place, He wants to grow some trees. Well, I wish I had a camera to take a picture of your face right now. <laughs> he wants to grow some trees. Amen. God likes to grow things. The Bible we just read here over the tithes and offerings, John 15, he's a husbandman. A husbandman is a vine dresser or a, a, a farmer who likes to grow things. You know, you go into farmer, you better like to grow things. God likes to grow things. And today he wants to grow some trees. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to pray over this time we have right now and the message from God. I'm going to pray a, a prayer right out of the Bible. Is that okay? okay? All right. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto all of us here the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, and the knowledge of our God. The eyes of our understanding this morning, Father, be opened and enlightened that we may know what is the hope of your calling, that we may know what the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints is, and that we may know what is the exceeding greatness of your power aimed at us who believe according to the working of your mighty power. And in this place today, Father, we pray it, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. This morning I want to talk to you from the heart of God about the hope of the gospel. There is a hope in this gospel, and we're going to find that hope this morning. All right? The Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And he's not talking about your blood pump. When hope is set off or set aside or begins to be destroyed, it begins to do spiritual damage. Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. And yes, you're right. God has sent me this morning to get your hopes up. Get your expectation of what God has promised us up. Amen. I mean, I'm sure you've heard from people time, at times through your life, now nah, don't get your hopes up on that. Well, that's not coming from God. God wants your hopes at a high level, a high expectation. As a matter of fact, that word hope in the Bible means an intense expectation. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, 
in which I stir up your pure minds. We got anybody with a pure mind here this morning? By way of remembrance. Let me say that again. By way of remembrance. You cannot remember something you don't know. You can't remember something you haven't seen. You know, get a, get a person. We had, uh, when, when we were growing up on the farm, we had this family come out, and they'd never been on a farm, ne never seen things. As a matter of fact, these children had never seen a goat. And so when they saw a goat, that was the first time we had goats. The guy across the street had cows. They were amazed at the cows. After they'd been to the farm, they remembered what a cow was. They remembered what a goat was. You cannot remember something you have not seen or heard. Okay? Make sense? All right. So Peter's saying, this is stuff you already have heard, but I'm going to stir up your mind by way of remembrance to bring a remembrance to you that you may be mindful of the words. Get your mind full of these words, he says, which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Peter's writing a letter here from an apostle dictated by God to him, writing it down to give it to us to stir up our remembrance in things we've already heard. Where did we already heard? From Paul, John, James, the other apostles, from all the prophets. All right? Now, turn over to, or look at verse 10. 2 Peter 3 and 10. But the day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord will come. Poke your neighbor and tell him the day of the Lord will come. Oh, poke him a little harder and wake him up now. <laughs> uh, folks, there aren't a lot of guarantees in this life from the natural standpoint, but we got a guarantee from the Word of God. This day of the Lord will come. All right? It will come. Turn with me now to Psalm 92. Told you, God is, God is looking to grow some trees in this place today. Shout amen whether you understand that or not. Because you will in a minute. Psalm 92, verse 12. Psalm 92, verse 12. The righteous. We got any righteous here? Amen. Oh my, about half. We're going to have to get you righteous before we read the rest of this. We got any righteous here? Amen. All right, it's a little better. One more time. We got any righteous here? Yes. Amen. All right. Then listen, this is talking to you. Well, are you born again? You're righteous. Amen. 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 Christ died on that cross to make us the righteousness of God. Yes. I mean, do you believe that or not? Yes. Then we are the righteousness of God in Christ. The righteous shall flourish. Now let me give you a definition of the flourish. It means to thrive. It means to grow. It means to become strong. I really like this. It means to make steady progress. So let me read it that way. The righteous shall make steady progress. Like what? And he compares it to the palm tree. The righteous shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. When we were over in Israel, I had talked to our guide, um, Malcolm, uh, about a couple of verses on, the, on these trees. And, and he said, oh, he says, we're going to go to a point where we can see Lebanon from Israel. And he says, I'll point those cedars out to you. So here we got into that area and he called me over. He says, you know, we can't cross the border into Lebanon, but you can look and see those trees. Huge, big, huge, strong, tall, 
mighty trees. God's comparing us to flourishing like that tree, all right, and like the palm tree. And you take these two trees and a little bit of study on these two trees, storms come in, and if there's going to be two trees left standing after a storm, it's going to be a palm tree and a cedar tree. They're that strong. Palm trees, you ever watch a hurricane go through and palm trees in Florida? They just kind of wave in. The <laughs> but when the storm's gone, they're still left up. They're strong. Now, let's do a comparison. Turn to uh, verse 7. Psalm 92, 7. Let's compare the righteous to the unrighteous for a moment. Psalm 92, 7. When the wicked spring up as the grass... And when all, listen to this closely, when all the workers of iniquity do what? Flourish. Huh. When the workers of iniquity grow and look like they're thriving. They're still here. Which means <laughs> they're going to rise up. It is that they shall be destroyed forever. Now, Get your mind off people at the moment. Because who are the workers of iniquity? Satan and the demonic forces that are in this earth. All right? He's saying when they rise up and they flourish, they are about to be destroyed. Are we seeing more satanic operations going on in this world today? Yes. It looks like they're flourishing, but they're about to be destroyed. Thank you for that one amen. That was good. 1 Peter 1.24 out of the Message Bible says this. That's why the prophet said, the old life is a grass life. Its beauty as short-lived as wildflowers. Grass dries up and flowers droop. In other words, we don't have to be overly concerned about what's going on and what the demonic forces and Satan are doing, how it looks like they're flourishing. They are about to meet their destruction. Yes. The difference is the righteous in the midst of the storm of the iniquity of the workers of that iniquity, we will remain standing. Amen. Well, to grow spiritually is going to take a spiritual effort. 1 Peter 2 and 2 from the Amplified Version. Like newborn babies, you should crave, thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk that by it you may be nurtured, and grow into completed salvation. Completed salvation. God has told us it is our year of fullness. We, we've been reading that verse almost every week, the verses from Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. In other words, we're full in Him. We're not going to grow up without the Word. We, we got Lynn's, there's, there's a friend of ours, and she's like a, been like a daughter for us, to us for a year, and her granddaughter uh, needs somebody to watch her a couple times a week. And this little girl, what is she, about 18 months now? Talks a mile a minute constantly. Nobody knows what she's saying. Hands go, I mean, she's got the hand gestures and the whole thing. But I noticed this week, there's some actual words coming out that we can understand. What's happening? She's grown up. Someone's teaching her to talk. Words. The words of God, the words of Christ are what we grow by. We need those words. Amen? Keep your place there in Psalm 92. We're going to come back to that, I think. We should get back there. 
Go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to read verse 15, then we're going to back up into this. And I just want to read, well, I'm going to read that whole verse. Thank you, Lord. But speaking the truth in love. What a statement. Speaking the truth in love. And I sat back and I thought, you mean you could speak the truth out of love? Speaking the truth in love that we may grow up into Christ in all things, which is the head, Christ. Christ is our head. The anointed one of God is our headship. Amen? All right. Let's go up here and, and dig into this just a little bit. Verse 11, and He, Christ gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. We call that the fivefold ministry. All right? Five variations of anointings in the ministry. Four. Here's the purpose. For the perfecting of the saints. That's us. For the work of the ministry. That's the fivefold ministry and us. And for the what? You notice it doesn't say for the tearing down of the body of Christ. It says for the edifying, the building up. I, I get this picture of building up, growing. Growth. Amen? So he's saying, I've sent this ministry to you to help perfect you, to help you to do the work of the ministry, and to build you up. A threefold purpose of a fivefold ministry, if you would. Verse 13. We're asking, well, how long is all this going to take? Here it is. Till we all. How many? All. all. Say all. 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 All of us. Well, right here. Let's, let's just look at right here. Because sometimes our scope, we, we can't get out the side, the scope of the small picture we've got. So for the moment, stay in the small picture we've got. Okay? God's talking to us here at Oasis of Life this morning. Till we all come in what? The unity of the faith. Not the faith of the church of God. Not the faith of the Baptists or whatever. The faith. In other words, we come into the unity. Mark eleven twenty two says, into the unity. We're talking about the unity of the God kind of faith. You all hear yet? God's desire is that all of us come into the unity of that kind of faith. Why? Hmm. And... We come into the unity of the Son of God, the knowledge of the Son of God. In other words, our faith is united in Him. Our knowledge is united in Him. Why? Because we know Him. Unto a perfect man. Hmm. Unto a perfect man. Well, now there's none perfect but Jesus you're right. I'm not going to argue with that. Would you all agree? Okay. But what is he talking about? A perfect man is a unit. He's talking about all of us coming together as one man in perfection of the knowledge of the Son of God with faith. A perfection of that faith. Making sense at this point? Okay, stay with it. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of the anointed one. In other words, all of us together right here. Whatever we've got right here coming together. Each of us bringing our 
anointings that God has given us and bringing it together so that we make one fullness. We make one Christ. We come to the place where Jesus himself was when he walked this earth. The church today asking, where's the power? Where's the anointing? Where's, you know, why aren't people getting healed? Why isn't this happening? He's telling us how to get it right here, folks. Y'all look at me right now like a calf at a nude gate. Is that the slaughter gate or the feeding gate? This is the feeding gate, folks. You're all right. Okay? Shout, no condemnation. Poke your neighbor and tell him we're not receiving condemnation out of this this morning. Hmm. So that we be no more children tossed to and fro about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. God doesn't want us tossed running here and there from, for this doctrine and that doctrine and, you know, oh, well, wait a minute, that church over there has that doctrine and this one has over here and, oh, let's, let's go see what's going on here and there. He wants you in the truth. He wants you in the truth. The next statement is speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. We have five Categories of ministry. And I'm going to sort out a couple of them here just for a moment. Lynn and I were talking about this coming over this morning. It, it used to be that the, the prophets' ministry, prophets thought they had to be hard and harsh and just come at you and slap you upside the head. and There was no love in it. So somebody comes and they got a problem. And let me ask your opinion. You come and somebody with that hard harshness that they think is a prophet's thing tells you the answer. Gives you the answer out of the word of God. It's the right answer. It's the truth. But then you sit down with a pastor who comes with the same truth, but with love and compassion. Who are you going to listen to? You don't listen to that pastor who's bringing the love and compassion. Amen? We all, okay? Unity, folks, we've got to stay on the same page here. <laughs> Yesterday, Lynn and I this week, we've been getting together and going through a, a study with Jeremy Pearson. We've been watching his broadcast and then going through what he had talked about. And yesterday... He went to uh, Luke chapter 10, which is the story of Martha and Mary. Jesus going to Martha's house. Mary sat at his feet. And Martha was busy trying to get the things in order for a meal or whatever she was doing there. Okay. We both saw the thing totally different. And so we, we, we got sat there and we discussed it for a while. The Bible says that Jesus came now to Martha's house and it says they were with him and he came. Do you know Jesus didn't travel with much less than 70 people at a time? Okay. I can prove that scripturally. I'm not going to do that right now, but we can. So here's this group of people shows up at Martha's house and Martha's sitting there. She's a, you know, she's one of these. She's a hostess. Can you imagine fixing a meal for 70 people? That's going to take some effort. It's going to take some work. But here's Jesus. He walks in and sits down. Sits down in Martha's easy chair. Mary comes in and sits at his feet. And Jesus when he's got a crowd, he taught. He took every advantage he could to teach the Word of God. And he's teaching the Word of God. As you'll find this in Luke chapter 10. And Martha finally come up to him and said, I need help. I can't do this by myself. Now I saw it 
from a standpoint of Martha, the Bible says she was encumbered. She was so overwhelmed with the situation, she was running around. I see it, her running around in a, in a panic. What am I going to do with all these people? How can I get all this ready? And then all of a sudden, you know, she's chosen to do that. Here's Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. Why isn't anybody helping me? Now, that's kind of the attitude I saw in the encumbered. Let me show you this. Can I show you this this morning? Mary, would you come? Now, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to play Jesus this morning. So I come into Martha's and I sit down. Here's Mary and some others. They're, they're sitting around and you see where Mary is. What's she doing? She wants to hear what the Lord has to say. Where's Martha? Busy. Busy. Now she's trying to listen. She's trying to listen to all this. But how much is she hearing? Now she looks at Mary. You see that? <laughs> then what happens to Martha? Do you not care? I, Mary's left me to do this all by myself. Would you please ask her to help me? Martha, Martha. Now I saw that comment by Jesus as Jesus trying to settle her down and get her attention. Martha, Martha, you are troubled by many things. In other words, it's not just this situation that's creating a problem in your life. Mary has chosen what's needful in her life right now, right here. Now that's the way I saw it. I did not see that Jesus was harshly rebuking Martha. He was just saying, Martha, Martha, trying to get above her voice to get her attention. Lynn saw it a little bit different. Start the whole, all right? That was kind of cute what you were doing. I just want to see you do that again. <laughs> so here we're, you know, I'm talking and I'm going through, teaching. Mary's down here listening. Here's how Lynn saw it. Jesus, I'm doing this all by myself. Would you get Mary to help me, please? Martha, Martha. You're troubled by many things. Now, what's the point? Thank you, ladies. Would you give the ladies a... What's the key point in this whole thing? The compassion of Jesus. He wasn't bothered by Martha running around doing what she was doing. He's trying to teach. Mary's down there listening. But when Martha come up, Martha, Martha, wait a minute. You're troubled by a lot of things. In other words, there's a whole lot of things behind what's going on with you right now than just being busy preparing this. Generally, the anger, the anguish that's coming forward in our relationships, generally, there's a little bit more to it than just that current situation. And that's how it was with Martha. And Jesus said, Mary's done the needful thing here. In other words, Martha, settle down. Don't worry about that. Come and listen. Then we can all help you. That's kind of the way we came to the conclusion that no matter how you look at it, whichever was her standing over him, yelling at him for help, or just behind him whispering in his ear. Two perceptions, both are right. Well, how can they both be right? They can't. We weren't there. <laughs> I hear this morning, got a few more things to deal out on this. We talked this, about this. And I listened to her perspective, and I saw it. She listened to mine, and I hope she saw it. <laughs> but the key is, how did Jesus handle 
the situation with words of love. Even though there was some correction in those words of love, he handled it with words of love, not anger, not anger. She just interrupted him from teaching and the Holy Spirit from moving. Hello. Let me go a little further with this. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Christ in all things, which is the head Christ. From whom, or from Christ, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. What does it mean to compact something? It means to put it together with strength, to put it together so every bit of that function operates the way it should. Amen? Now watch this. By, from whom, from Christ, the whole body is fitted, fitly joined together and compacted, by that which every joint supplies. Now he ain't talking about a beer joint. He's using the comparison of your physical body to how the body of Christ should operate. Have you ever gotten up at night, middle of the night, you've been sleeping, you get up, you know your house, right? Get up, go to the bathroom and run into something, stub your little toe, probably the smallest member of your body. And what gets your attention? That little member, the pain in that toe, has now got your attention. <laughs> right? Why? It's out of joint. It's out of joint. How many of you like coming in here on Sunday morning and the carpet's all cleaned and the thing's dusted and, and you go in the restrooms and the toilet paper and the paper towels and the soap and everything's in there and the restroom's been washed and cleaned. How many of you like that? Amen. That is supplied by Joint Randy. <laughs> Amen. Didn't know you was a joint, did you? <laughs> he does this. Nobody sees him. But he does his function and assists the whole thing. Amen. Tammy Powell right now. She's putting together our, our, our music on Sunday morning. Spends hours seeking God, going through music, getting it all ready. You enjoyed our praise and worship? That's joint Tammy. How many of you get a thrill? Now that's, again, behind the scene. How many of you get a thrill sitting here and it does something for you when you watch Beth, Beth and Tammy on the platform that they're not up there showing off. They're up there worshiping God. I say worship in them. And it causes me to get in a little bit deeper in that worship. Well, that's joint Tammy and joint Beth. Finish the message. You know, most of the time we don't give Nelson a song to play after the message. We test him every Sunday. <laughs> he keeps our sound going so we can hear. He, he, he keeps things flowing in that manner. And then he'll, he'll put a song on that God's laid on his heart. And I'll tell you, mo most of the time, and I'm trying to think if there was a time he missed it, he's got it. That's joint Nelson up there. Amen? What's going on? It's people flowing in unity. And every aspect of that, you think, oh, well, yeah, the praise and worship, boy, that's important. So is what Joint Randy supplies. That's important. Amen. People come into a dirty church, they're not going to stay. Hello? The point being, folks, every one of us here today has a supply going into this service. We have a supply. Now, I'm going to take a, a step out here. 
and I'm going to walk on a thin ledge at the moment. This applies to our households as well. Every person in that household has a supply to the well-being of that household. There's a father supply. Or let's go with what we've been doing. A father joint. There's a daddy joint. There's a mother joint. There's a mommy joint. Hello? Those all have to be in unity working together. If any of that joint is out of kilter, you got a dif- dysfunctional family. As you would have a dif- dysfunctional church. Couple comes over to, on their way to church, gets into an argument, walks into the church. They're both angry with each other. Is that going to affect the whole service? Yes, it is. Well, I don't know about that. Let me prove it. Do y'all remember Israel going into the promised land? Hmm? They crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land, standing in front of Jericho, the most fortified, biggest city in the area. But they crossed over that Jordan River in, in the unity of covenant. What went first? The covenant. The covenant. Joshua, their leader, says, here's what God's told us to do. Walk around the city once a day for six days, all of us, in silence. They did it. Now they come to the seventh day. They've been, they probably had, this, this is my take on it anyway. They probably had those people up on, in Jericho on the walls throwing stuff at them, swearing at them, just carrying on. And they walked around, didn't say a word. And now Joshua gathers them all over. Three million people, approximately. All right, folks, here's what we're going to do today. Probably told them the night before. Here's what we're going to do tomorrow. This is our seventh day. This is the day when Jericho falls. Oh, probably a shout there. All right, now we're going to walk around the city seven times in one day. Together, in silence. That's a long trip around that city. Took a while, especially for three million people. And he said, when we get to the end and the last person arrives, we're going to shout. Notice, The walls hadn't come down yet. But the walls literally collapsed when they shouted and stayed in unity for that whole week. Whoo, great. Now God tells them. Now think about this. Put yourself in their position for a moment. All the spoils of this huge city, all their silver, their gold, their goods and everything, that's mine, says God. Don't touch it. Hmm. Everybody in Israel listened, but one man. Achan snuck in, got greedy, got what he wanted to possess, took it to his tent. I can tell you he knew he was wrong because he hid it. Read the account. So here they go from Jericho They just beat the most fortified, strongest city, the biggest city, the the toughest city in in the whole promised land. Now they face little Ai, the smallest city, the easiest city to take. I'm sure that the folks in Israel thought, oh, this is going to be a cakewalk. We got this. Go in there and get whipped. Joshua's a little perplexed. What happened? What happened, God? And God said, you got a problem in the camp. Somebody's broke unity. That's my paraphrase of what's going on here. Somebody broke unity. Somebody in that camp didn't listen and didn't do what I said. And here's the point, folks. That was their first fruits 
their first fruits was Jericho, somebody touched it. Somebody touched what belonged to God. The rest of everything in the promised land was going to be theirs. Achan would have had more than he could have ever thought or even handled. But he harmed the whole nation. One person can't do much. Hmm. One out of three million. Let me see if I can finish this up. Is this all right? By that which every joint supplies, watch this next statement, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Every one of us has a measure. But all of our measures come together and they add up to a complete picture. It's called the corporate anointing. Can I be effective in any of that part if I take steps out of love? I know it's heavy in here right now. But folks, it is heavy with the anointing. It's heavy with the anointing. And that anointing this morning is destroying strife, anger, and bitterness in this place right here today, right now. For what purpose? So we become effective with one another. We can't do this. We can't have church without joint Randy. We can't have church without our intercessors. You don't see the intercessors praying and when they're praying and what they're praying. But we need them. God showed me it was going to get heavy in here. Simple solution. L O V E. That's the simple solution in our households, in our church. It's love. Speaking the truth in love. Martha, Martha, let me get your attention a moment. He wasn't dressing her down, he wasn't shoving her aside, he wasn't criticizing her. Martha, you got a problem that has created and built to a bigger problem. Every one of us here is a joint in the Oasis of Life ministry that God is establishing. Every one of us has to become effective in our measure, whatever that is. And look what it says, when we do, it makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Shout amen or oh me this morning. Hmm? All of us, we need to find the place of the love walk. Well, pastor, what is that? Brother Jerry, what is that? Anybody ever read 1 Corinthians 13? Whew. There's some tough stuff to uh, accept in there. Hmm? Eh. Bible says get angry and sin not. How do we do that? We change over from that anger to love. We want the church to grow. God wants us to grow as trees, and the way to do it is walking together in love. You better stand up, because if I look at my outline again, we'll be here another two hours. I believe that, that God has been restoring souls in this place this morning. Restoring relationships. They're important. They're important to all of us. 
Folks, whatever else we do in our households, in our church, in the body of believers, we got to stay in love. In love with one another, obviously in love with God, but in love with one another. Amen. Did you get anything out of this this morning? We'll give the Lord a shout of praise. Next week, we're going to take a walk through the tabernacle of God. We're going to take a step-by-step -step approach to go through that tabernacle. God said in His Word in Mark chapter 11, we read verse 23, 24, boy, we've got man faith speak to the mountain, be it removed and so on. We've got to always take 25 and 26 with that. When you stand praying, forgive. Listen to this. For if you do not forgive, God cannot forgive you. Folks, it ain't worth hanging on to and allowing that anger to develop into bitterness. That's trouble. Amen. Well, I did my best to speak to you the truth in love today. I love you all. God loves you. Let's just have a love fest in this place from now on and love one another. We're different. We don't always see the same thing the same way. But that doesn't mean we got to walk out of love. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord one more shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lynn, come on. Come on. Oh, Heavenly Father. Oh. We join together right now and thank you for your truth this morning. Help every one of us, Holy Spirit, to make a full commitment to the truth we heard here today in our households, in our church. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, Father, I release the angels of glory to build the blessing wall, the hedge of protection around every vehicle out there. We go down the road without incident and arrive safely at our destinations today. Father, give everyone here peace, comfort, and rest. And Jesus, thank you because Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you.